Well, you have to, first of all, you have to realize that uh, I was born and raised on the Blackfoot, and uh, so I have a lot of memories. My grandfather on my mother's side, whose last name, by the way, was Fish, F-I-S-H, um, was a serious fly fisherman. My great-grandfather on my father's side uh, was a fly fisherman. Gramps, we used to call him. My father was a fly fisherman. And so I have a tremendous number of very fond memories, uh, even when I was very young. I fished six, seven, eight hours a day as a boy prior to 12 years old, 14, I guess. Uh, that's about all I did. I, I do odd jobs, you know, go in a little money, but up until I was 14, I fished that river just about every day, all day long. And uh, when I think about the river being destroyed, the potential of that, uh, I get emotional. <laughs> What's well, Montana's Family River? Uh, that is, you'll, you can go up there any day in the summer and you see people, families from Great Falls, uh, Helena, Missoula, um, from local communities up to Blackfoot, people of all different economic stripes, people of uh, all different types of backgrounds, uh, people of all different recreational types, from kayakers to rafters to inner tubers to fly fishermen to bait fishermen. It's a really great thing about the Blackfoot. It has a lot to offer everybody in Montana. You don't have to be wealthy to go up and enjoy it. And there is no other stream that I know of in Montana or not too many other streams in the world that have the diversity of fishing opportunities, of habitat, uh, and scenery, and total experience that the Blackfoot can offer. It, and it, it's a treasure. This Blackfoot River and its tributaries are our arteries and our veins. And that's what keeps life in the Blackfoot watershed going for all of us. I think I heard about the proposal, the possibility of, uh, of another big mine on the Blackfoot. Um, I probably suspected it when I first saw some of the dirt moving that was going on on exploration. And uh, I guess I got concerned right away. And, and then I started to hear rumors about Phelps Dodge and, uh, and the fact that they were doing exploration for a possible large mine. Essentially, they want to take the uh, McDonald's meadow and uh, reduce it to about 980 million tons of waste rock and gold-bearing ore. The mining process that they're going to use up at the McDonald deposit is a cyanide heap leaching process. Uh, the waste rock and gold-bearing ore is loaded onto uh, heap leach pads, and a dilute solution of si sodium cyanide will be applied to it. Um, during the act of life of this mine, uh, nine and a half million pounds of sodium cyanide are going to be used every single year to leach this gold out of the rock. And where the Seven Up Peat Joint Venture is, is one of the biggest drainages in the upper Regis. It's right on the Landers Fork of the Blackfoot River. And in the top 30 miles, that's, that's the biggest drainage. 
there will be two cyanide heap leach pads raising, rising over 600 feet above the valley floor. Those will be left there in perpetuity. In addition, two waste rock piles will be left behind. Uh, those waste rock piles will also be about 600 feet tall. The waste rock piles will cover nearly 900 acres of land up there. And it's just going to be a complete alteration of the landscape. Most importantly, though, we're going to be left behind with a big open pit. Uh, the pit that they're proposing to leave behind will be over a mile long, nearly a mile wide, and over 1,000 feet deep. 7-Up Pete Joint Venture is going to be one of the largest open pit gold mines in North America, okay? Overall, this thing's going to cover probably something like uh, 5,500 acres of disturbance. That's the direct disturbance. That's not the off-site disturbance, which there will be, because off-site, there will be off-site wildlife, water, fishery, recreational, and social impacts. They'll stretch all the way down the Blackfoot Valley. What you hear from the big companies and Phelps Dodge directly is um, this is the highest in technology. This is the best that we know. We will not backfill our pit because it's not economically feasible. Um, but we have all the information that you all need to know that this is going to be a safe gold mine. There will be Beyond a shadow of a doubt, no spills, no troubles. Well, there's a lot of things that can go wrong uh, whenever you're disturbing large areas of land and piling up big heaps of rock and, uh, and handling large quantities of some toxic material. There's a lot of things that can go wrong, and a lot of things have gone wrong at a lot of sites in Montana. The impacts on water are, are uh going to come from a whole bunch of sources. There will be the immediate on-site impacts at the mine. Guaranteed, um, I'd bet a year's salary, which isn't a lot, that uh, there will be groundwater pollution. And the groundwater system around that mine is intricately connected to the river. And the groundwater pollution will come from uh, leaks, guaranteed, of a cyanide solution. This very caustic solution is stored in big ponds uh, and then is pumped up and, and uh, trickled through the heap. And so the heap, the pond contains cyanide, the heap contains cyanide, um, the pipes that carry it contain the solution. So there's all these different uh, things that contain cyanide and any of those, any sort of break or leak from the structure that contains the solution could release it into the environment to infiltrate down to groundwater or to run off to surface water. We've lived in Pony since 1978. We came here to start our business, build a house, raise a family, live in a place where it was very clean and quiet. And we enjoyed doing that until 1989 when we had a a uh, cyanide vat leach mill proposal right above the location of our dream home. Six years later, unfortunately, we've become the poster child for the bad practices of the mining industry. They're saying they're using state-of-the-art environmental protection technology. They're going to have a double-line cyanide a heap leach pad. And we feel very, very confident there's not going to be any surface water leaking inside. And then we've designed these systems so that there's not going to be water leaking through the sides. And our ponds are set up so that we've got, uh, I guess, redundancy or duplication so that if we have a leak in one, we can shut it down, transfer water, and go ahead and repair it and get it going. The company told us that this uh, impoundment would not leak because they were using a double liner system. As soon as they began to use the mill, the liner started to leak. And then shortly thereafter, they discovered cyanide in our well. Now that there is a leak, there is no way to contain it, and only by spending a lot of tax dollars can it even be fixed. The interesting thing about the cyanide technology that's in use today, the industry likes to promote it as a state-of-the-art technology. And what we've found to be more true is that it's experimental and untested. In our research in the state offices, 
we found that every single cyanide operation in the state has experienced fluid losses. They all leak. This operation is po in Pony is a, a, a tiny operation compared to Zortman Landowski and, uh, and the proposed mining at Lincoln. Uh, there's just no way that they can stack that much material on a plastic sheet and expect it to keep its integrity. There are going to be leaks. Another big impact at some uh, heap leach sites, and that's the problem of acid rock drainage, as it's called. If the uh, ore being mined, or if the waste rock that's over it contains sulfides, those sulfides, when exposed to oxygen and water, will form sulfuric acid and the sulfuric acid can then um, dissolve heavy metals, many of which are quite toxic, out of the rock and um, flow from the, the rock that produced them. SMI drainage, the problem with it is once it's tapped, once it's released, you got it for a long time, through geological time. It's a genie you can't stuff back in the bottle and this very acidic water that's now laced with toxic heavy metals and, and also another nasty substance called arsenic can be in it as well, uh, can flow into surface waters or infiltrate down into groundwaters, contaminating them. I'm saying that this particular deposit has, uh, oh gosh, probably, I'm not sure, but well over a thousand and maybe approaching 2,000, uh, but well over a thousand uh, analyses uh, that have been conducted of the rock chemistry, of how the rock chemistry operates under various conditions. Uh, the ore body itself is unique in the fact that it is heavily oxidized and it doesn't generate acid. It's very hard to predict, apparently, whether or not a site is going to have this acid rock drainage problem. Uh, Quite a few cyanide heap leach sites were not predicted to have uh, an acid rock drainage problem, like uh, Zortman Landusky Mine is a good example, and I guess the, I think the Golden Sunlight's another. Um, they were not expected to have acid rock drainage problems, but now they do have very bad acid rock drainage problems. We began experiencing problems with our water as far back as 1982 when the native trout were found floating in the different streams in this northern drainages of uh, the little Rocky Mountains. Uh, Virgil McConnell, an elder, was at the time a police captain of our police force. And uh, he turned these into my father, Raymond Helgeson, who was the tribal judge at the time. Uh, these fish were sent away and examined, and they were found to contain uh, quite a bit of heavy metals in them. That's what caused their demise. The acid itself is toxic. Uh, the um, heavy metals are, are simply directly toxic to aquatic life. Their aquatic life is very, very sensitive to a lot of heavy metals like copper and, and lead and so on. And arsenic is also a concern. Uh, we done a preliminary blood test on uh, about 15 people. Now, out of the 23 children that we tested, 15 of them had elevated lead levels. Uh, four of them out of that 15 was uh, high enough to concern a doctor to begin shots and uh, clean them up. So what did they do with that information? We gave it to Hillary Clinton two years ago. And I'll get back to you. You never did. Yeah, just upstream from where the the Seven uh, Up Joint Venture uh, uh, is proposed is proposed to be located, 
is a historical mining district called the Heddleston Mining District in the very, very uh, headwaters of the Blackfoot River, several small tributaries up there. Um, there are two mine adits, that is, old underground mine workings, uh, the openings, that right now are kind of spewing out acid mine drainage. It's very colorful, real orange, because you, what you see is you see uh, iron oxide. It's one of the, one of the, the, the products of uh, acid mine drainage. Around uh, 1987 and into the first part of 1988, we started hearing concerns from uh, uh, Blackfoot Valley residents and also longtime fishermen in the river that um, you know they had uh, they had a feeling that the numbers of game fish and the sizes of game fish were declining in the Blackfoot River. We determined that inputs of mine drainage into the headwaters of the Blackfoot River. Um, were the most acute water quality problems in the watershed. The main problems that we found affecting the Blackfoot River uh, were number one was mining. We're starting to show fairly major impacts in terms of low numbers of fish and particularly in the, in the upper areas loss of young of the year or reproduction of fish. Even as a boy I had fished the river above Lincoln uh, the Blackfoot above Lincoln, and there, there was a wonderful native cutthroat fishery up there. Uh, and I guided clients uh, above Lincoln in, in the Blackfoot uh, up until 1975. After 1975, and what is this, 20 years now, I have yet to find a reason to take people back up there to fish. We have not seen recovery in the headwaters over these last 20 years. It's actually gotten worse. It clearly points out the persistent nature of mining-related impacts. Um, they don't go away by themselves. <clears throat> these kinds of insults don't heal themselves readily. I think we've got some serious problems out there, and we need to be thinking about uh, getting a handle on cumulative effects and turning the current trends around rather than adding insult to injury. And I would conclude that yes, I, I think we are, we are reaching a threshold in the Blackfoot. I think the status of the bull trout in the Blackfoot drainage is an excellent indicator because the bull trout is just like the miner's canary. It's an indicator of very clean water. They do not tolerate uh, sediment in their natal you know, spawning streams, sediment inputs um, at all. Um, the fact that the bull trout is in serious trouble in the Blackfoot watershed and there are, I believe, only three significant spawning populations left in that watershed. And the three spawning tributaries that are important originate, for the most part, in either wilderness or relatively undisturbed watersheds. And, you know, there's a message there. That's all that we've, uh, that's all that we've left them. There's three main tributaries in the Blackfoot that those fish spawn in the North Fork, Montour Creek, and the Landers Fork. The Landers Fork runs right next to this mine. The last thing we want to be doing is putting a large mine on top of a critical part of the remaining habitat. That's what's being proposed. So the bull trout is a key indicator for the health of cold water ecosystems in western Montana. If we cannot maintain these cold water ecosystems, uh, we're going to lose more than just bull trout in the future. In a recent response to a environmental report card given to the governor, um, Governor Roscoe said that Permitting of mines is not a political issue, it's a scientific issue, and the law prevents him from being involved in that. But there's a couple of things that, that I think about when I hear the governor say that. One is, the science isn't there. When you look at science, you also have to look at history. What has been the ability of uh, the mining industry and the regulatory agencies, ability to predict with accuracy what the, uh, you know, the environmental outcome of hard rock mining uh, will be.
it has been awful. And what we have to look at when we see that is, well, who permitted these mines and who's enforcing them? And the answer is the Department of State Lands, the same people who will be permitting this mine. Uh, we need to look if they've done a sufficient job in the past in permitting and assuring that environmental resources and water resources are protected. Um, from the track history of these mines, it doesn't appear that they have. And what can they do to assure us that things are going to be any different at this project? Senate Joint Resolution 28, passed in 1993, requested our office conduct a performance audit of the Hard Rock Bureau at the Department of State Lands. I, I found this Hard Rock audit to be incredibly disturbing. Uh, discussions of non-compliance, discussions of failure to notice violations of the law, discussions of, of, of uh, penalties arbitrarily reduced. One of the things that I found most disturbing about it is just what it says about the job this department's doing and what it says about our ability as the public, our ability to trust that the laws are being enforced. Contrary to what some of the public may think, the Montana Constitution and the Metal Mines Reclamation Act envision the taking of natural resources by mining if certain requirements are met as outlined in the Reclamation Act and MEPA. The Hard Rock Bureau's role is neither to promote or inhibit mining, but only to fairly administer the statutes and in that way meet the intent of the law to provide for the environmental and public protection. We were under, under the impression, as most of the public is, that applying for the permit indicates that there will be at some time a determination made whether there will be or will not be a permit and that's not the case once the permit application is complete a permit is is written there has never been a permit for mining denied in the state of montana clearly the pattern of this report documents consistent difficulty with accounting for processes and practices of the department. And contrary to editorial interpretations, the audit findings do not necessarily translate into environmental damage. Why did the department grant a permit to a mine on unstable ground and cause that mine now to have significant con economic consequences and the people in the community and that work for the mine? They don't know what their future is. It's got some other problems that you're aware that we've had concerns about, but you got a landslide under a big mill. And now we find out that that information, that geological knowledge, could have been g gathered. The Zortman Landusky mine. We've got serious acid mine drainage problems up there. The environmental community and citizens living in that area brought that to, your, to the attention of the department and the company. We said, <coughs> Violations being ignored, big problems. The department's response was everything's okay. But then, wouldn't you know, three months later, acid and metals found in mine discharge and now a big lawsuit's going on against that company. And I guess what I can say is I'm not going to talk about other properties. I'll tell you about our property. Our property has uh, had extensive studies done on it. Those are public. They're being reviewed by the state, I'm sure. I can guarantee you that they're being reviewed by the agencies in light of everything else that has happened in the state. Uh, I know that because uh, of the questions that we receive from the agencies. They're very sensitive to problems that have gone wrong elsewhere, uh, predictions that have been off elsewhere. Uh, some preliminary soil tests we've done and water tests that we've done. Uh, lead is pretty damn high in it. And no one, and I mean no one, regulating agencies seem to show any concern of it. The mining industry have the influence of politicians and whatnot. So they are the real culprits, but they alone cannot do these things without having the blessings of the regulating agencies. They first talk about Lincoln and it's where it is in regards to the Continental Divide. Um, it's a sleepy little high mountain town on the west side of the Continental Divide. Uh, its economic 
sources are mining, timber, and recreation. So they always say mining, timber, and recreation. But there again, the stable, one of the three, is the recreation. And historically, it always has been. These boom and bust situations, and I've lived through two or three of them, have been with timber and with mining. If the mine goes in, uh, my interest in Lincoln business-wise is going to wane. There's no way around it because the interest of my clients won't be there. The history of Lincoln that has sustained us, that has paid our bills, that has been there year after year after year, it hasn't been any false hope, has been the recreationalists. That can work for us forever economically, not just for 20 years. And the money stays in Montana. It doesn't go out to some corporate coffers, either out of state or out of country. So this project is basically a 25 year project? Yeah. So after 25 Beginning years, what do the people of Lincoln do you know, when, you, when you pack up and move on? A lot of, you know, what did the people of Lincoln do? Uh, first of all, we would anticipate uh, from at least the studies and whatnot that we've looked at is the majority of the people are going to live not in Lincoln, but in other places. You know, that's just, uh, there's not a whole lot of people in Lincoln uh, to start with. But uh, the, that particular potential impact is part of what will be looked at during the Hard Rock uh, uh, impact planning process. And there are, there are funds, of course. I know a lot of the, the local people are concerned, and I, you know, rightly so, about what happens to uh, uh, local infrastructure, uh, uh, I don't want my taxes to increase, and things like that. And that's, uh, those are all great, good points, and they're right on uh, of the concerns. In spite of what they might like us to believe, I don't think that they really care what the long-term impacts of Montana, uh, to Montana are of this mine. The big mining companies, board of directors, and their, uh, their CEOs, uh, uh, I know what's driving them. It's the dollar. And it's the dollar soon. Why is everything for sale to the highest bidder? Is that the only value things have, is how much money it costs? I think their clean air and water is worth more than any gold bauble that we would, we would wear. Most of the gold processed in the world today is turned into coins and jewelry. I think as a society, we're going to reach the point that we're not willing to pay the price of gold. What we have done in the past, and what I'm afraid we're going to do again, is we're going to make decisions to help those of us that are here now uh, financially, and our heirs will pay for it. Our heirs will pay for bad, unwise decisions that we make now, such as the 7 Up Peak Joint Venture. There's something about being able to give that river to my kids that you can't put a dollar to. You know, we can't do anything about what's already happened except to uh, tell our story and let other people know, hey, <laughs> could be your town. Right. It's coming your way, people in the Blackfoot. Thank mm -hmm. you.